Good morning, everyone. Happy International Women's Day and a very warm welcome to Glandor 6 here from her celebration. As you can see, we've chosen to host our event virtually again this year, um, just so as many of you as possible can hear from our amazing panelists this morning. Um, but just because it's virtual doesn't mean you can't have a glass of bubbles in your hand um, to celebrate the day. So make yourself comfortable. Um, and I hope you really enjoy and get a lot of inspiration out of this uh, next hour. Before I introduce you to our wonderful panelists, um, for those of you who are joining here from her for the first time, my name is Claire Kelly and I'm a director in Glandor. Glandor is a family business and a leading provider of flexible workspace in Ireland. And um, we celebrated our 20 years uh, in business last year. Over those 20 years, uh, we have accommodated and supported a wide range of companies from indigenous startups and SMEs to international companies establishing operations in Ireland for the first time. Um, and our mission in Glandor is to facilitate their growth and success. Um, we believe that businesses need the right environment and support to achieve their full potential and that networking, mentorship and peer learning are hugely important and valuable in achieving growth ambitions. Being one of three sisters in our business, we are also cognizant that female role models in business are hugely powerful in changing attitudes and in um, empowering women at all stages of their careers. Seven years ago, I attended an event that one of our panelists was speaking at. I was hugely impressed and inspired by her journey, her incredible career, her drive, um, and especially her advocacy and support of women through the initiatives that she was involved in all whilst raising a family of four children. Hear From Her was born the following year to hear from more stories, to hear the stories of more female leaders, I should say, in our community, to celebrate their achievements, to learn and be inspired by their journeys. Through Hear From Her and our support of initiatives like Starting Strong um, and also uh, the 30% Club, in addition to our recent sponsorship of the Business Post's How I Did It Women in Leadership podcast, Glandor aims to connect, support, and celebrate women, not just on International Women's Day, but throughout the year. I am so honored to welcome and introduce our first panelist and inspiration behind Hear From Her, Marie O'Connor. Marie was an audit partner in PwC, uh, where she worked for 30 years before her retirement in 2017. During this time, she established the um, asset management, highly successful Irish asset management and financial services practice. She is currently chair of the governing authority of UCD, and non-executive director of Davy Global Fund Management. She's been appointed to numerous state boards as non-executive director over the last 20 years, and she was a founder member and country lead for the 30% Club in Ireland. Amy Connolly is the founder and CEO of Sculpted by Amy. The award-winning company is one of the fa Ireland's fastest growing beauty brands with a range of over 70 products since it launched in 2017. Sculpted by Amy now has 17 staff and over 300 sockets in Ireland and has recently expanded into the UK. The brand also has a flagship store in Dundrum, as well as an education arm called Sculpted by Amy, and it has um, trained hundreds of makeup artists since it was, uh, since it was opened. Rachel Reedy is the founder of Or2 Communications and the head of Albright Ireland. Albright is a global leading career network for women with an inspir inspiring platform to connect, upskill and supercharge their careers, ultimately to change the narrative for women in business. Rachel returned to Ireland during the pandemic following 20 years working in the UK and London, where she worked for Condé Nast Publications. During this time, she launched Wired into the UK and headed up digital and brand partnerships teams for British GQ, Vogue and Glamour.com. And last but not least, Neve Parker is a co-founder, chief legal and people officer at Altada Technology Solutions. A Cork-born serial entrepreneur based in Glandor, Cork, which we're very proud of, Neve started her early career in wellness and in the wellness and sports industry, and then on to hospitality through her Thai cottage food business. Neve moved into legal and tech in 2013 and is a huge privacy advocate. In her role as Chief Legal and People Officer, Neve has scaled Altada from nine individuals in 2019 to over 130 in currently across 11 locations and is positioning the company to be the leading industry leader in their operational AI platform category. Thank you all so much for being here today. To all of our attendees who are joining in such numbers, um, we're really thrilled to have you here. Um, before I, I, I kick off, if anyone has any questions throughout, please pop them into the Q&A box. We'll get to them before the end of the session. Um, but if I can start, Marie, with you, 
Um, Marie, you have had an incredible career, uh, which has been punctuated by a lot of firsts. Uh, you were born in Dublin, first of five children. You were also the first female student in a business studies course in DIT, where you achieved first place overall on graduation. You also went on to become the first female partner in PwC in 1986. Can you take us back, Marie, to where it all began and to who and what might have fueled your ambition to succeed and lead? Thank you very much for asking me to speak today and for those most flattering remarks and I'm delighted to be with such wonderful panellists and I look forward to hearing all they have to say and as you and I discussed I suppose we're very lucky to be in Ireland today even though it's desperate weather outside you know we're, we're not in the Ukraine and you know what a, an absolute tragedy so whatever we can do to help people there is, is really important. I had the good fortune of good education and through various routes I chose not to go the more orthodox way to do accountancy. So I went to the College of Commerce rather than going to maybe one of the uh, universities at the time. I did certified accountancy as opposed to the more majorly recognised um, accountancy. I was fortunate enough to get a job at PwC. And I suppose one of the things I've always been able to do is to is just explain what my unique selling proposition was because it was a slightly different story and once your story is slightly different it's it's so much easier to get your message through and I didn't come in with any grand plan and I'm just like everybody else I took one day at a time I suppose I was fortunate um, in college being the only girl in that the guys were all very encouraging and I sort of wasn't afraid of men and I had plenty of mentors etc when I joined Pricewaterhouse like any of the accounting or law or other professional firms these are competitive places mm -hmm. so once you're in you know you are actually focused on how am I going to get that next promotion how or how am I going to get that exam because actually all these other lads are going to be getting their exams and I'm going to be left behind mm -hmm. so I suppose it's really only looking back that I realized they were all very helpful things. I also was interested in people and I took on a number of external type things and um, which gave me a much broader network and I suppose made me better able to do my job. I was fortunate in finding mentors. Mm -hmm. uh, again, being a competitive place, you do look around and you might ask, well, can I do that job, mm -hmm. etc. And they're all very important things, asking. Mm -hmm. um, when it come, came to be the time for to become a partner, the partners explained to me look there are no barriers to this and I was wondering do these fellas even know what they're talking about I'm a woman I have a child I'm not a chartered accountant and but actually there weren't actual barriers there there may not have been women who had got to those roles before me but there weren't any barriers it was just a question of you know somebody getting there there were people who did accountancy before me in Craig Gardner and um, I mentioned Joan Burton was my boss when I started these were very successful women, but they chose to do different things. They chose to go into industry just like the guys did. Mm -hmm. I chose to stay in and made my way through the partnership. I did um, ask, could I, should I not be doing a foreign tour? Because the lads who were becoming partners had all done a tour and the partners would have said, oh, where would you go with all those kids, etc." But I went to Canada for six months. I had a wonderful time. I became a partner as a result. I learned an awful lot more about international industry. Um, and when I came home, the firm asked me to get involved in inward investment from America. And you know how successful all of that has been, Claire. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful idea for Ireland to focus on inward investment and subsequently on the IFSC. And they give loads of opportunities to people like me who are interested in being international, taking out that Ireland message, being an ambassador for Ireland and really making your professional and personal goals aligned. If you talked about that there wasn't any barriers within PwC, was there a culture within PwC that really encouraged women to grow and to, and to develop into leadership roles? Um, or did it just attract that kind of personality and, and, and ambitious? Um, I think it wasn't about women, it was the organisation was just a place where people were competitive and we had wonderful clients and it was a great place to have on your CV, etc. So therefore we did attract very good people. Not everybody stayed because people, you know, did want to go out into industry and got absolutely super jobs. But of course, we always remained part of our network and we can rely on those today. Um, so I think the simple thing is that just there weren't any barriers. And when I asked the partners years later, did you sit down and decide, oh, we'll make a woman a partner? I said, no, we didn't do that. You were part of the next group of people that were coming through. Yeah. Um, I think subsequently organisations look back and they say, oh, look, we only had one person and 
why didn't we have more? Should we be doing things? And I myself have looked back and said, should I have done more? Because, you know, you're getting on with your life and your family and all the rest. You're not necessarily looking around to mind everybody else. But I do now realise how important that was. And I suppose that led to me taking steps like joining the 30% club to help other people do steps maybe that I should have done earlier. Well, you know, in terms of like, it sounds like you had a lot on your plate already. And, and but in terms of, of, you know, your at that time, and you, you would have been, there wouldn't have been a huge amount of, you know, leadership role models, uh, female leadership role models um, at that time. D is there somebody that you looked up to, or was it that the encouragement that you got from your, your partners um, and your, your colleagues, your peers? No, no, I think I, 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 you've often heard me say this, that I kind of developed my own board of directors. So I had a kind of group of people that I used to go to for advice. I didn't have actual meetings of them. I obviously went to them individually, etc. And so I had, a, you know, a number of advisors and I used to talk to people just like everybody else does. And every leader in business goes and consults before they make major decisions or when they're in, in challenging circumstances. So I certainly sought people's advice and that it all really moved from there so I didn't have any single I can't say there's a woman up there or a man up there that I aspire to be I think you aspire to be yourself and you pick up good qualities from many many people and you don't necessarily need to have a replica of yourself that wouldn't be good but I think you learn from some all your experiences being in that competitive but also being skilling yourself up to to survive in those competitive analysis or the environment yeah. is also really important and you're a certified um accountant and a barrister at law um, in addition to doing your your business studies course so you're hugely you know yeah. qualified yeah. in terms of going into that environment um and what i also loved um you spoke about how you know you you proved yourself by getting top grades you got the first place in your overall year in the, in the business studies course um, and, and that's something that, you know, that inner drive and ambition is, is just so impressive, Marie. Um, and, you know, obviously has led to your success, you know, it, it, throughout your career. Um, but you did have an incredible career in PwC, 30 years. Um, I, I'm surprised they let you go at all, <laughs> but it was phenomenal. And under that, at that your stewardship, um, the financial, the Irish asset um, management business that yeah. you built, was was world class you know and um you know what what challenges or triumphs you know along the way did you experience in in, in establishing that because you were very much an entrepreneur within pwc setting up your own your own um division and, and yeah, you're you're far too kind uh, Claire, it was absolutely great fun um charlie i had announced we were going to start the ifsc come hail rain or snow he got all the firms around Ireland to get involved. He phoned the senior partners and he said, you're going to have to help out here, etc. So I was one of the ones who was asked to help out on our side. And um, we were making it up as we were going along. We hadn't a clue. Thankfully, we had a wonderful brand in Pricewaterhouse and great colleagues in Pricewaterhouse offices abroad who did our best to kind of repackage us up as if we did know something, brought us out to meet their clients. And you know, over time, Obviously, lots of those clients came to Ireland and our role was to make sure that we, we, we looked after them, etc. Um, and you had to get well known in that market. You had to speak at events, etc. Um, marketing totally in conjunction with the IDA, etc. I mean, it was a, a wonderful idea on the part of the government and I suppose private sector were involved in it too. And then we just really set about making sure that it happened and made Ireland a, a very good place from which to do financial services business. But that's something that we have to, and I know you speak about this too, Claire, we have to make sure that we keep selling Ireland as a very good place and that we make certain that Ireland is a good environment for international companies uh, to thrive. And within my own organization, I just always made sure that I had a very good team around me, both we knew all those people abroad who could help us, and we had built a good team in Dublin. Mm -hmm. And you need to have people that are different to yourself, you need to have people that have skills that you don't have, so that in combination, uh, the whole organization works very well, and I'm sure everybody else will, will say that too. No, absolutely. And we had great fun along the way, and there were wonderful highlights and lowlights, and being invited to the White House and all these kind wow, of things so were all absolutely wonderful. So, but it just shows, uh, you know, putting your hand up and, and actually taking those um, opportunities. And, and actually, Anne Herity spoke about this last year at last year's panel. It's just 
putting yourself forward and, and putting your hand up when an opportunity crossed your path. Don't say, don't look the other way because you never know what that will, will bring for you. Um, mm. And it's really important. Absolutely. Career In fact, I always say your employer is not telepathic. You have to tell them what you want because sometimes, particularly in the past, you would find that um, um, a male would say, I won't ask Marie to do that job because look she's two kids and she's whatever else and actually if he doesn't ask Marie to do that job she doesn't a snowball of the progressing yes exactly absolutely so benevolent bias might be very nice but it won't get you anywhere so. no and um, tell me so in 2015 um you were approached um by the founders of the 30 percent club and um, to set up an Irish chapter tell me how you got involved um, and, and give us a little, we, we obviously we were very fortunate to have Rachel Hussey last year, um, but for those who missed last year's event where we talked about the 30% Club, can you share about the why it came about um, and how you got involved and you were the first country lead um, of the Irish chapter? Well, I was asked by uh, the Bank of New York where Helen Morrissey, who ran the 30% Club in the UK, worked. Um, about starting and around, would I host it? So we, we chatted and I again just look back and as I said earlier I probably could have done more for women earlier in my career if I'd known that and if I'd known that it was important to speak out etc um, and I thought well do you know what I'll actually do this and try and make up for a little bit of lost time and um, I agreed with them that we would be a totally collaborative network that we would all have make sure that our competitors were part of the the organization and um, there was no advantage to and um, being part or not being part of it we were all trying to solve a problem that nobody had managed to corner the market and species to and co companies weren't competing on this front they were all anxious to work on a collaborative effort to try and do the right thing so i suppose now we've developed our message a little bit we try and focus on supporting chief executives and leaders in business in understanding what they can do about diversity and um, we try and influence and those who can be influenced, whether that's at national level, public policy level, various fora, et cetera, about the benefits of, of diversity and actually how you can actually make traction. And then we try and look to women and, and encourage them to help themselves, and whether that's through mentorship or scholarship opportunities or continuing education, et cetera. And we try to provide a, 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 an awareness and courses etc for them so it has developed quite a lot but we've 260 leading companies who support and um, the 30 percent club work together we set up divisions with either financial services or food or whatever the various sectors because sometimes the issues within those sectors are slightly different and you have to look at your own da data and find out what are your own problems and then can we try and solve those together so i think great progress has been made we do a survey of irish business and see where are the women and just the short version of it actually it's really important that women get themselves into profit and loss or revenue generating roles if they're actually going to make it to the most senior levels in business and mm -hmm. um, and very often you find that while women are senior in business they both they might be in hr or in marketing or whatever and i think it's just important that people should have the feedback from the service as to who are the people that are most likely to be progressing if that's in your mind absolutely it's a, it's a very important point um, and and also uh, just in terms of the initial aim because there has been huge progress made as a result of setting up this 30 percent club and it's apart from the collaboration and the well and lots of other things care I mean, we certainly aren't the only reason in progress that we made progress we made because of all the men and women in our and the men and women working together absolutely no and, to and that's the, to our absolutely but in terms of the initial aim the initial aim was to have a, a minimum of 30 percent um, female representation on the FTSE 100 companies um, and as, as of this year it's now 40 percent representation on the FTSE 100 companies yeah. which is fantastic and then in, in terms of the Irish context we're also progressing so we're now at 30 percent um, female representation across the Isaac 20 um, boards um, but the challenge there is a, a, a huge challenge still at senior leadership and looking at the pipeline um, what what are the challenges there along that pipeline what is what's what's creating the the block um, in terms of, of women progressing on internally into that apart yeah, from so it, yeah it's, it's the executive roles actually that there okay. still is so 
somewhat of a dirt and there are more women than in the past. And I think um, one of the things that we've done in the 30% club is to try and prepare a toolkit for companies. Now, depending on what stage of the uh, maturity the company is at with regard to its diversity, you may well be just starting out on the diversity road or you may be further along. So we've set out a toolkit for you, which effectively ask you first of all to think about why do you want to have more women at senior level is it good for your business so mm -hmm. can you set out the kind of rationale then you need to sort of attract you need to retain you need to develop all of those women you need to engage them and the organization ensuring that you are going in the right direction of course you need to measure what you're doing so i think you need to take action on all of those fronts if you are going to try and diverse organization but you need to know why you want to do that why is that good for your customers why is it good for your staff why is it good for the organization yeah and and what gets measured gets done you know measuring the the progress that you're doing and throughout the that yeah, yeah. Post. absolutely um, what I might do is I might bring Rachel in here now. Marie, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, Rachel, you're very welcome. Um, you are the head of Albright Ireland, uh, part of the Albright Collective. It was founded by two very impressive serial entrepreneurs, Debbie Waskow and Anna Jones in the UK, set up in 2018. Um, and what I love is it, it's named after a very famous uh, and formidable lady, Madeleine Albright. Uh, she's the first female US Secretary of State. And she had a famous saying. Do you want to, to, to share with the <laughs> audience, Rachel? She did, she did. Thank you so much for having me, Claire. It's a pleasure to be on the, on the panel with these amazing women. Um, yes, Madeleine Albright very famously said that there is a special place in hell for women who don't support one another. So um, when Debbie and Anna, who you just mentioned, um, our co-founders, when they were thinking about launching this business, um, you know, they, they decided to kind of call it Project Albright. It was really a code name. They weren't sure what they were going to call the business. And so it just kind of stuck, really. So um, they had to add an extra L in for, for copyright reasons. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a great, um, a, a great name. And it's, it's something that people always ask us about, you know. It's fantastic. And, 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 and we've got another name later on, which we'll share um, for Altada. But in terms of, of the Albright Group, how might your efforts and what you're doing in Albright complement the efforts of, of the 30% Club and other initiatives that are supporting women in, in achieving their goals and, and career aspirations? Absolutely. I mean, I guess, you know, with, you know, with the Albright um, uh, platform, the main way that you can um, uh, engage with the platform is through our app. So, um, you know, 80% of the content on the app is, is free. And then the additional 20% um, is behind the paywall, which is all the coaching and the mentoring stuff. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of kind of, you know, groups in there. So there's a women in Ireland group. Uh, it's a very engaged um, group. I've had numerous conversations with the 30% club about ways that we can kind of work together um, through our, our network, which is fast growing. So we have um, just shy of a half a million uh, members globally. So I think one of the kind of key USPs of, of Albright over other, over other networks is that we do have a huge global footprint. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whilst we pepper the platform with lots of amazing content of, of local, local women who are, who, are, who are doing amazingly with their um, startups or female founders, um, you know, we, uh, you know, there's lots and lots that we can kind of do together and share, you know, there's, there's, I guess that one of the kind of USPs of the platform is that we do have that kind of global feel to it. And as such, a lot of people like the fact that they can connect with a variety of, of people in different groups. So whether it be women in marketing, women in business, women in financial services. So there's, you know, there's lots and lots of ways that we can collaborate in, in, in that way. And we also run a lot of L&D programs as well. So um, whilst I know the 30% club can't be seen to be favoring any particular programs, you know, we do have slightly different programs that would lend themselves quite well to various different industries that, you know, are represented by the 30% club. So we do a lot around DE&I, we have male allyship programs um, as well. So there's a wide variety of content that we have as well that's existing that we are licensing out for a lot of, um, of brands at the moment as well that's, that's of interest. And you're aiming at women at all stages of their careers. So you have programs that are very much focused on, on supercharging careers and, and building confidence and skills. But then you also have um, leadership programs in terms exactly. of that director role or the executive role. So can you tell us about those specific programs and what the difference between them is? 
Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, we're very careful to say that, you know, the the network is very much about women at all age and all stage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in our physical uh, club in London, which um, I was just at last night, um, you know, there's a, you know, there's a real lovely mix of, of, of age groups. So there's, you know, there's kind of women who are just starting off in their careers, and then there's women who are much more experienced in their careers. And that's why, you know, networking is at the heart of everything that we do. And we talk so much about sisterhood and how sisterhood works, you know, as, as Marie, you know, mentions, it's all about paying it forward to the sisterhood. So trying to really instill all of that kind of experience that we have to the younger generation that are coming up through the ranks. Um, so uh, I guess a lot of the programs allude to those. So we have a career accelerator program, which is kind of like our always on most accessible program, if you like. So it's 12 weeks. Um, it's very, you know, um, reasonably priced at kind of 600 euros. And you have um, a lot of access to some great coaches who can really help with, you know, imposter syndrome, self belief and really try and build confidence because from the women that we speak to so many of them talk about you know just not having that confidence mm -hmm. and so much of that really requires you to go back inside and look at yourself and and and, and um you know and that's so so that's a very very um popular program that we have we also then have a senior leadership program called elevator and that's very much designed to really help women at that kind of mid-management level to try and get up to C-suite and kind of board level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, as we know, being in charge of a PL is is very important. So for lots of women, it's about giving them the skills to be able to read balance sheets and to understand, um, you know, compliance and um, and governance. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's all very well and good getting there as well. You know, it's staying there and, and particularly for women trying to balance it with home life as well, because... You know, the reality is that it, it is different for women versus versus men. So they're the two main, main programs. We're rolling out Elevator later on this year for the for the Irish market. Um, and then we'll also be rolling out Mentor Matching as well, which is very exciting as part of the app. So that will sit alongside Sisterhood Matching, which already exists. So it'll be much more about encouraging uh, women to have mentors, which which is obviously very important. And a lot of the kind of you know female founders that we speak to have either had great mentors in the past or they kind of say, God, I really regret not having one. Mm. Just in terms of your own career, Rachel, you've had um, an incredible career with Condé Nast, 16 years you spent with them in, in the UK, but you also had a fantastic um, base in terms of, of digital marketing and you got into the, the I suppose that world quite early on um, through various um, uh, roles within Jaguar I believe you had a it sounds like a fantastic um, a very glamorous um, life I'm sure it wasn't all that glamorous though at times um, it, it's a difficult industry to get into how did you get your foot in the door? Gosh, well, it's a bit of a mismatch because I left Ireland in 2000 with the intention of literally just going to London for a year because I, I, I kind of hoped that I'd settle in Ireland one day. But, mm -hmm. you know, obviously I went to London for a year and, and 20 years later, you know, um, I, I return home. But, you know, I suppose for me, I really did feel that digital was at the forefront of, of um, you know, where I wanted to be. And I could really see this kind of shift in a similar way to what we're seeing now with Web3 and this whole new kind of immersive space with NFTs and metaverse. Um, I guess, you know, for me, I really wanted to be in that kind of digital world. And I was very lucky. I started working for um, for Jaguar um, and I was there for four years at a time when they were involved in, in, in Formula One with Jaguar Racing. And, and I guess the automotive industry at the time was very advanced because there was so much that you could do online. You could book a test drive, request a brochure, configure your own car. Um, and so it meant that we were able to really kind of target people who may be in the market for a new car and really serve them with content that they would like. So um, I learned a huge amount and then uh, I worked at um, Carlton Television for a while and um, just about the time that they were due to be bought by ITV and it was actually a really quite special woman, an Indian woman called Parminder Veer, she's an OBE, who I worked with very closely there and um, she really helped me with that kind of next step in my career because I suppose it was a bit of a pivotal moment and I knew that, you know, next moves crucial in a way. And so she helped me to kind of, you know, figure out what I wanted to do. And so I approached Condé and asked and said, listen, you know, I'd love to work on brands like Vogue and Glamour, but I want to work on the digital side of the business. And they were shocked because print was so prominent and, you know, digital was nearly like the poor relation at the time. So, um, you know, they kind of said to me, now, this isn't going to be a stepping stone for you to get into the magazines. And I said, well, that's fine because I want to work in digital. You know, it was so exciting. We were launching YouTube channels and social media and doing great partnerships with super brands. So 
Um, so that was really how I got into it. You know, Parminder kind of said to me, look, sit down and make a list of all the brands that you really like and places that you'd like to work and just apply, yeah. you know. Um, and so and so I did. And it just, you know, it just kind of happened to work out, which was which was great. And you spent 16 years there. You had uh, working with incredible brands. Um, but then the pandemic hit. And like a lot of people, we started to reassess where we were at in our careers, where we were at in terms of our family life. And you made a, a, a big, bold decision to, to, to move home. Um, you, you mentioned that all roads were leading home for you at that point. Um, yeah. But you came home without, without a, a role to go to. So tell us what, you know, that, that transition for you and how. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I came home to be bridesmaid for a friend of mine um, who managed to get a wedding away in the midst of COVID. I don't know quite how. And I was meant to stay here for two weeks and I ended up staying for two months because at the time I could work remotely. Um, and then just the thought of going back to, you know, my 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 small kind of apartment and, you know, um, I just wanted I was used to kind of more space. And, and, and I, I just it, there was so many signs everywhere. It was quite incredible. Um, and so I just decided that, you know, for me, it was time to leave Condé Nast after 16 years. And I'd, you know, I'd worked on such amazing brands. And I know 16 years sounds like an awfully long time, which it is. But I suppose because I moved around within, you know, the company so much, it didn't feel so. And um, I just decided to take a leap of faith. And so I left the business. Um, I launched a communications consultancy and um, I decided to get some clients. And, and I'm excited that, you know, I'm still doing you know stuff with Condé Nast which is which is great and I managed to sign Albright as a client um, a year ago and I just thought from being home and trying to find networks and trying to engage with like-minded people that um there was uh, there was an opportunity here so I reached out to the founders and and said look you know what do you think and, and before I knew it I was in the club in London and you know they kind of said right off you go and, and now I'm I'm in a role where I'm looking after UK and Ireland at the moment as well. So it's it's gotten much, much bigger, but it's it's exciting. It's so exciting. And and really, you know, I, I, I wasn't familiar with I have, I'm dying to go and see the place in, in, in Mayfair, but um, I, I hadn't been familiar with Albright until last year when when we got in touch. Um, and what really impressed me, apart from the platform, apart from the learning, is just that the future proofing of women, you know, the focus. Um, Debbie Wasco and Anna Jones are very um, acutely aware of the challenges that female founders have in terms of scaling their businesses, the, the gender bias in terms of VC funding. Can you share a little bit about some of those events that, that um, Albright have been involved in terms of found her with HSBC um, and, and how that's making a difference? Absolutely, absolutely. So, so the two ladies met only in 2017 and they met very serendipitously at a dinner uh, one evening and they both bonded over the grim statistics surrounding women in business. So Anna was the very first female CEO of Hearst Publications and um, the first female in 100 years. And, and since she left, she was replaced by a man. Um, and, um, and, and Debbie was a tech, um, you know, a tech entrepreneur. So she'd been buying and selling businesses her whole life. So Anna was experiencing it at board level and Debbie was experiencing it at VC level when she was trying to secure funding for her, you know, for her various different businesses. So, you know, it was a real um, um, a passion, you know, a, a point for the two of them that they would create something that would allow women to access capital. So, um, you know, Albright actually started as, as a fund you know so it was a VC fund that was trying to raise money for female founded businesses so you know um, as a result of that they wanted to um, uh, launch uh, pitch days and we have a very successful pitch day franchise which um, HSBC are involved in so we did a pilot program for them last year which was on a smaller scale and you know it performed incredibly well a lot of it was about really marrying um, these female founders with capital with mentors and in many respects through our our um, network customers. So, you know, because we now have, uh, you know, 500,000 members, so a lot of them end up being customers. But the HSBC initiative has just gotten even bigger this year. So, you know, we're doing it, we're executing it in, you know, the US, Canada, um, Singapore, um, Hong Kong, uh, and the UK. So, you know, it's a really, really, really exciting project and in fact you know we have a whole host of events going on in the club this week to celebrate international women's day and one of which is another pitch day that we're doing for iwd for goldman sachs um, and that is particularly surrounding um trying to help um, um female founders to secure capital particularly uh, women of color and, and black women because 
you know, I mean, I'm not sure if we're aware, but, you know, before COVID, only 2% of, of um, VC money went to female founded businesses. And in COVID, that's halved. And the, the story is even worse uh, for, for women of colour and black women. So it's really important that, you know, we, we, we um, do, you know, we kind of look after them as also. So that's the purpose of the Goldman Sachs uh, pitch day that's going on this week. And hopefully they'll come to Ireland soon as well, um, because I know yes. that we, um, that's a very grim statistic of 2%, but in Ireland, it's a little bit better. I think it's around 10%, yes. but still not enough, you know, when you consider the volume of, of female startups that are coming out. And, and, and I'm going to um, talk to you now, Amy, in a little bit about starting strong and going for growth and these amazing programs that are supporting female founders. Um, but definitely there's the VC funding is, is, you know, seems to be not just VC funding, but funding it in general um, and access to, to cash flow um, is, a, is a, a pain point for, for female founders um, and, and, you know, in terms of progressing and, and you know, increasing the number of female founders out there. Um, Amy, I might move on to you just as a female founder and a very impressive female founder at that. Um, Amy, you've put an incredible um, story, incredible success over the last um, not even five years. I think it's it's four and a half, five years old, um, sculpted by Amy. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. We're we're just um, after hitting the five year mark. So, you know, I always feel going back to how we should promote, you know, non imposter syndrome, some of that in various kind of events or panels or discussions that I'm in, because you know, although we've had amazing success today, and it is not to override that, you know, to me, as that kind of entrepreneur, you're always looking ahead going, well, we still have to do this and this and this and this and this. And, you know, it's there's, there's so much ahead, which is so exciting as well. But yeah, we're very much in the infancy of our journey, I think. Well, in there's not many um, people who are in their infancy winning so many awards. You're stockpiling <laughs> awards over the last few years. And in particular, the Ernst & Young, the Young Entrepreneur of the... I'm going to mess up that, that name now. Young Entrepreneur of the Year, um, EY Young Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, it's incredible. Sorry, not Young Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur of the Year, I should say. I, I did mess that up. Um, it's incredible. You you uh, were the winner in the emerging category. You were the youngest winner of the awards in its history, I believe. Um, and not only that, but you've also been asked to join the judging panel um, alongside Anne Herity, um, who was on our panel last year. Um, I, it's just absolutely incredible. Congratulations, Amy. And you, it's well-deserved success. Um, but can I take you back to, to again, to, to where it began? Um, you, you, like a lot of teenagers, you had an interest in makeup, but um, you really developed your interest through work experience in the makeup counters in, in uh, Benefit, I believe, and then a first job in Urban Decay. Um, and then you became a freelance makeup artist. Um, now, it's a competitive industry. And obviously, you know, there's lots of makeup artists, but very few of them take the plunge into setting up their own brand. What was the opportunity that you saw in the cosmetics industry and the, the makeup industry um, to launch that spurred you to, to launch Sculpted by Amy? So it's funny, I always say that my career kind of started um, subconsciously or like, you know, without my own actual awareness of what I was going into and like that with work experience, you know, it's a mandatory two weeks, we all have to do it. I very last minute got two weeks in work experience and benefit. I was 15 at the time. So I was like, you know, just like so excited to be on counter, loved the side of makeup, could literally sell to anyone because I was just so eager about what I was doing. So that kind of, you know, excitement really shows in the passion for the products. Um, so I had spent roughly about six years working in makeup, but in that interim, I had finished my leading search and then done a four-year degree in commerce and French. So I had this kind of dual roadmap where I really liked makeup and beauty, but I was also really intrigued by business. And when I started working for myself at the age of 19, I kind of knew that, that was going to be it. I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do yet, but I knew that I was never going to go and work in a corporation. And it's funny, now when I'm sitting down in the business five years later I sometimes think was it a negative that I didn't have corporate experience prior to this because you know like no one teaches you how to be a manager or, or how to hire people or the do's and don'ts particularly when I haven't seen that kind of chain of command but anyway that's kind of separate so when I graduated and um, I was 22 I you know all my peers were kind of going to the big four or one of those which I thought was great but I just knew in my own self that I wanted to continue with beauty but at the same time I wanted to build more of a business kind of and ultimately that was the brand. So given my experience kind of working with global brands at the time, it was totally invaluable to kind of learn about the products, consistencies, the customer profiles that would come in, 
And um, so really for me, the biggest area of opportunity, not even the sense that it was fully missing, but in terms of what my signature style was, was mm-hmm. pairing everything back and creating like multi-purpose kits. So that's essentially what, what led me to sculpt it. So the initial product was like a, a contour palette that took the fear out of contouring basically, because at the time it was like this overwhelming amount of information about using like 60 steps. It was yeah. like, was time for 60 Kim Kardashian steps. look that <laughs> nobody could um, quite look like Kim Kardashian <laughs> after doing it. Um, that's amazing. So, so you started with one product and I think when you, uh, I met you back in 2018, you were just graduating from the Starting Strong program and you had the one, um, one palette, I think you were launching or planning to launch a couple of other products at the time, um, but now 70 products later, um, or maybe that's even more, I feel like there's some coming out every week, so I'm probably <laughs> behind on those stats. But how, how has your brand um, evolved over those five years? Um, is it the same? Is it the same approach or has it had to adapt um with changing trends perhaps i would say it's the same approach it's just gotten a little bit more structure to things which the team would be very glad to hear because obviously when you are starting on your own and i was that classic one woman band like you know packing orders at the kitchen table pretending i was an an account under a different email to get paid off suppliers and you know literally wearing all the hats because that's what you have to do but that really suited my personality down to the ground because i am very much someone who likes to get into the detail, likes to understand what's going on before I kind of hire someone else in. Yeah. You know, if I was to do things now, I'd have much more confidence getting experts into roles and not just being arrogant, thinking I can do it all when when I can't, you know? And yeah. um, so, yeah, it just, it, it's kind of, I suppose from a product point of view, I'm still heavily involved in that with the factories that we have around the world. And um, like the team has grown. So at the moment we're, we're 23 people. It's, you know, still relatively small compared to many businesses, but I suppose I only had one full-time team member in 2019 to put a bit of context on it. So, and obviously Ireland is still very much our, our majority market whilst having launched into the UK and kind of further expansion inspection this summer. So it's kind of like extra products, extra territory, extra team members, and everything just gets a little bit more structured, which is great. Incredible. Tell me, how did um, Starting Strong, I, I know that you also subsequently went on to do um, the Going for Growth program yeah. and, and continuing the momentum, which was an incredible path, uh, a suite of initiatives that was um, uh, founded and, and, and led now by the uh, incredible Paula Fitzsimons um, National Director. How, during that period, because obviously the huge growth over that period, um, how did those programs support you and what tools did they give you to really you know go from a a baby business to kind of a fully fledged international you know exporting business so i think the the great thing about the going for growth program as a whole is the minute you walk into the room with paula who was just amazing um, you, you instantly feel trust and you know it's a safe space. I think that's so important because you can all be so precious over our baby, which is our business and, you know, our ideas and finances, particularly when like you're starting out and again, not having come from corporations, I was quite, you know, new to the whole world of kind of how things operate like that. So I think the brilliant thing about the different roundtables is you're you're around a table with, with like-minded businesswomen in a similar stage of business, but completely different industries. And the interesting thing is, you know, someone who might have a farming business and I might have cosmetics will have the same HR issues or the same financial issues or the same cash flow struggles Mm -hmm. along the way. So you instantly kind of connect on that level. Mm -hmm. So along with having an amazing lead, so I had Susan Spence, Louise Phelan and Bridge are done here, three absolute icons in in the business world. You pick up different things from each lead. So it might be sales, it could be HR tips, it could be um, expanding and kind of building out your operational structures. But aside from that, actually the women around the round table with you like I said just having that safe space having a place to vent if you're having a bad day and you know you can't really go to your friends because they don't understand the same level because you know they're working in a different area or on a different scale and it was just brilliant and I think it's it's such an amazing initiative that they've created that has gained such momentum Mm -hmm. and hopefully will be will be here to stay. And, you know, reminds me of what Rachel was talking about, the sisterhood, you know, there's such support and such peer learning when you're uh, around, you know, fellow ambitious women who are, you know, so keen to support each other and see each other grow and, and, and succeed. And um, so it is, it's phenomenal. And, and the, the, the incredible businesses that come out of it, Shupi Sweetman was on our panel last year. And um, Susan Spence has also been on our, our, our here from her panel. Um, and what was amazing is at the, the entrepreneur of the year awards in your category, there was also, there was a few of our the growing for growth alumni 
um, in that category. And I know Leonora O'Brien was also um, in the uh, finalist last year. So it's just an incredible legacy um, and, and incredible initiative that, um, that are really kind of um, guiding female founders through that kind of tricky period in terms of growth where, um, you know, I suppose self-belief is, is hugely important. I think you've talked about that as well, Amy. Um, you know, that, that is a challenge for, for female founders is that, um, you know, um, entrepreneurial ambition, they might have ambition, but their self-belief can hold them back. What, what's your motto? You mentioned that you have a, a saying that you, you repeat yeah, and it, it's just very, very simple. Like one of the biggest questions I always get asked is how, you know, at 22, did you have the confidence to go and set up a brand? Yeah. And like I always say, hands up, honest answer. Like sounds like a cliche is I, I just didn't overthink it. Like I don't allow myself the time to get into that headspace where I freak myself out. Because yeah. if I was to think now about all that was ahead, I'd be like, oh gosh, no, I don't know if I can do that. Whereas at the time, you know, and, and even with things now, like I try not to get too nervous with things because I just don't let myself dwell on things too much. You know, like other issues might become bigger for me, but I just not think, not overthinking it, going with your gut and actually believing that you can do it. So you focus on the positive side. It absolutely won't always be positive. You'll have a million and one issues to get through, but eventually the issues become less and less as you get numb to the fact that they're always recurring. So you just get better at handling them and dealing them with them. Um, it's so getting yes. skin to, to, to some, yeah. some mistakes along the way. I'm going to bring in Neve because Neve also has, um, you know, what's incredible and, and very inspiring, the, the self-belief and, and the, um, I suppose, the, the, um, the passion for your brand. Um, Neve, you're, you're the Chief Legal Officer um, and, and People Officer of Altada Technology Solutions, um, co-founded with your husband, um, Alan Beechnor. Um, you're an incredible power couple. Neve is joining us from, um, my, not Miami, West Palm Beach um, and uh, at six o'clock in the morning. You're incredible to, to, to join us so early. Um, firstly, the Thanks for the opportunity and it's lovely to share the panel with these amazing ladies. Um, I've learned so much already. Well, we we're, we're blessed this morning, but um, I, I love the name Altad as well. Can you tell? Because we've talked about Madeleine Albright and the connection with, with Albright, but um, Altada has a great, great name as well. What's the, the origin? Yeah. So Altada, the Alt is the higher form of intelligence and data that we work with. And then the Ada is after Ada Lovelace, who was the first um, woman to write um, a machine learning algorithm. But unfortunately, unfortunately, she wasn't credited for years later because her mentor, um, Charles Babbage, took the credit for it. So it's great that she's getting the recognition that she deserves um, today. So we're delighted to have um, her name at the end of our brand, which is great for us. Amazing. With um, you know the equality that we're trying to you know promote and the diversity within our leadership team and and across our tech team actually, um, we're really proud that we're up to thirty seven percent already. Um, female participation across the whole organization and 50% in our C-suite as well. Um, so we're hoping by the end of Q2 that we'll be at 50% across the whole organization, which we're really passionate about. Um, and I mentioned I have three daughters as well, like Lily. So um, it's really important for, for both Alan and myself that there is that equality and diversity across the organization. It's, it's, it's so incredible and so impressive, um, Neve. I know the two of your most senior roles that you've just been have both been filled by, by women, um, Chief Commercial Officer and I think your Chief Innovation Officer as well. So congratulations on, on, on the, you know, the progress that you're putting, you know, building in, into your business. Um, in terms of you, you came up with a really great way of explaining what Altada does, and I'm not going to use my definition of it because yours was much better. Um, <laughs> What, what does Altad do? Yeah, it's very simply, very simply we, yeah, we teach machines how to read um, documents, loan files, um, large data sets, unstructured data sets mainly. Um, mm -hmm. And this to allow people to make better decisions, whether it's on buying portfolios of loans or title review in financial services. Um, we also have two other arms of the business, which is security and healthcare. Um, as well. So catching some of the bad guys with human trafficking um, algorithms, which is really interesting work that we're working on. And then in healthcare as well, um, assisting, we assisted heavily during COVID with analyzing the spread of COVID and different data sets and stuff. So it's anything to do with data and unstructured data. Um, and we're scaling rapidly. Now we're at 130 people 
um, in 11 locations. And it's very exciting. Um, I think Marie said last Friday when we had a quick um, pre pre meetup um, is that, you know, timing is everything and the market will tell you when your product is ready for that kind of scale. So you have to really be, you know, always researching your industry and know what category that you fit into to allow you to take those opportunities um, to be able to scale. And really, we think that it's, you know, the right people, the right product and the right time for Altada. Yeah. to be the leader in our category. And what is driving the, the demand um, need for, for your solutions? I think the, the pandemic the has the definitely, yeah. yeah, the pandemic has completely like accelerated um, digital transformation, Claire. So that's the first part. But then the second part is, you know, with people being like in remote working and handling large data sets and people weren't in the office and they were having to do a lot of this heavy lift manually, that really kind of accelerated the adoption for artificial intelligence as well. Um, so what we're doing is we're combining human and artificial intelligence to um, better understand your data, to make quicker, faster and better decisions. Um, yeah, so it's 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 partly to do with also a disruption of an industry which hasn't been disrupted. And I know Marie will know this from her experience in PwC is financial services has never been disrupted. Um, but it's time now and it's it's very, very competitive because um, you know, if you can reduce the workload of that, well, a lot of the work that Marie and the big four like would have been doing previously is that due diligence piece, Claire, on, you know, large M&A, large loan portfolios, um, big merger and acquisitions, for example. A lot of that heavy lift can be done now with tools like Altada's um, doc intelligence tool. So um, we are we're operating in the doc, document intelligence area. So, yeah, it's very exciting. It's absolutely um, incredible. And, and the industry as a whole is growing exponentially. Um, I think the global AI market is set to increase from 10.1 billion to 126 billion in 2025. Um, and I suppose in terms of, of people who are kind of starting out in their career that are listening today or, or kind of, you know, looking for a change, like what are the career paths to getting involved in, in you know, joining Altad or, or, or another AI company? There's so much opportunity um, for non-technical roles as well as technical roles, um, you know, like product owner roles, solution architects roles, um, like people involved in the creation of the solution, because a lot of things have to happen for AI to work. Like there's no silver bullet to, oh, let's plug and play this because everybody's organization is different. You've got old systems you need to integrate. You need front end, back end. Um, you need a full customer success team because you know it doesn't like it's not a press and go silver bullet solution artificial intelligence your organization has to be invested in adopting and accelerating this change it's like it's not like a, a revolution it's an evolution because it's changing every day every month with the introduction of like emerging technologies so your your organization has to be ready for that change um so we're all already onto quantum computing now and speeding up the speed of our ingestion um we're putting mortgages on the chain on blockchain um so it's 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 a mixture of everything we're not just like an ai firm we have to be a software house we have to be a back-end front-end design we have to put design on the products claire so there's so many opportunities um and i guess in one way for us you know with you know the likes of rachel coming back to ireland and more talent coming back into ireland that we've seen that you know unfortunately during the pandemic there was a lot of job losses for women and it was looking like um it was going to become a, a she session not a recession but that the females had to take a step back during the pandemic for caring and you know organizing home and school life um, but we're seeing now a lot of a, a lot of that talent coming through for us, which is very exciting as well, that have decided to leave like, you know, organizations maybe where they weren't supported during the pandemic. Um, and, and we're seeing and I know it's testament to the great talent that we have attracted as well. That's great. And there's a lot of been a lot of, um, I suppose, uh, focus on increasing the number of uh, females in, and women in, in STEM. There's only 25 percent of roles currently fulfilled by by women in, in STEM, but there's so many initiatives, including your uh, fellow Corconians, I wish, um, with uh, Carolina Driscoll and, and Gillian Keating that are really okay. trying to, um, you know, drive more women into, into STEM and and uh, and these roles, which is incredible. Um, speaking of, of, in terms of, uh, of support- well, our, head of engineering is, our head of software engineering is a woman. Oh, sorry, Claire. Just our head of software engineering is, uh, is female as well. And at a longer data science team, we've all senior people in those roles. So it, you know, they are out there. Um, and it's just very exciting that there's more and more coming through. So I think that work is really important. Um, and just as a mom of three, just, you know, just encouraging your girls that they can do any job, you know, that is, it's not one role or another that, yeah, you can, 
you know, you know, be a scientist, uh, be a data scientist, be a software engineer, um, that it kind of has to start really at a, at a young age. So it's great that, you know, they've gone into the schools and really solidified that as, as a career choice as well. So that's really important work. And one of the, just before, because I, I want to get onto some questions as well from our, our audience, but um, tell us about El Salsa, Niamh, that you founded with um, Trinity College uh, Tangent, um, which is an AI accelerator, um, which is, is fantastic. And I think that you're also bringing up that gender diversity to that accelerator as well. Yeah, I think when we were having the conversations with uh, Ken and his team in Tangent about whether or not it would be positive discrimination to have 50% of the places for um, female participants, but we've stuck to it um, and we've really tried to fill those those spaces for half half but unfortunately there's been a lot of lack of self-belief in the founders that go forward to the application process and the interview process and sometimes even after getting their place clear they still don't have the self-belief to um bring it to fruition and join the program so we've lost a few good ones that we've, we've got one back this year now that felt she was finally ready but i knew she was ready last year um so i just think that that self-belief is alive and well and i think it's something that we really need to encourage um more female founders not entrepreneurs coming up is you know their male counterparts don't have as much customer traction uh, don't have as much knowledge in their industry but they think that they're ready for a program like ours um so it's really important that we've, we've we have that we've selected we've kept those places for female um last year's winner uh shohini from mpl and again another amazing female ceo and founder um trailblazing um you know the improvement of health initiatives and intervention um very very it's going to be a very exciting journey for those guys and again a female-led business and we know the female-led businesses do better we know they make better use of funding we know they they do better but we need to do more to make sure we get more of them into um and like great for Amy started so young as well I was the same I was my own business at Kinsale my own restaurant at 23 years of age don't ask me how I got there but I, I was there doing it and my landlord my landlord at the time who I had to ask for money to set up the business said to me my god you're so gutsy you know but I didn't know anything better like Marie I didn't know any any better um that because I just had that drive and passion that I wanted to do it um so I think it and it's it all stems with self-belief as Amy said it's like you need to believe in yourself, you know, um, if you don't believe in yourself and you don't see yourself, nobody else in the world will see you if you don't see yourself. Um, and I'm always saying that to my team and my female team every day, like I start off with the risks and what's the risks today? What risks have you got today? Um, you know, you come into work basically with your elbows out getting through those risks, but like believe in yourself. I believe in you. You like I've given you this role because I believe in you now just go and do it. Mm -hmm. and I think, Claire, you said that as well, that your dad would always be saying to you, Claire, just do it. Just go for it. Go just for go it. for it. We think we're going to put go it for on it. Yeah. tombstone. <laughs> go for it. Exactly. Just, just go for it. Yeah. It's a real entrepreneurial, you know, that grit and determination and self belief is they're, they're real characteristics of, of an entrepreneur and very successful entrepreneurs as well because you can't. Um, I, I, and I, I also remember um, Anne Harris, said that, you know, you can't. Uh, optimism is such an important characteristic of, of a successful leader and and um, and founder um, and I'm also reminded that um, and something that I've repeated and this is the, the value of these these conversations um, and Harry you also mentioned um, a little mantra I, I don't know if any of you recall uh, going up the hill is I can and I will I can and I will I can and I will and then as you come down I knew I could do it I knew you could do it so it's such a smaller thing but I do it now with my own children when we're going out for a little run I'm dragging out of the house I'm like come on we're struggling here but you know it's it's just all these little things just to kind of really keep those that um that positivity and and um and motivation up um I have some questions here that I really want to get to for for our audience and and I, I could literally this could go on for another two hours because I'm, I'm enjoying the conversation so much but um morning everyone great discussion my questions to the panelists have you ever had to stand up for female founders in the Irish ecosystem um Marie maybe I, I might give that to you if, if I could so have I have you ever had to stand up for female founders in the Irish ecosystem Oh, Marie, you're on mute there. I haven't necessarily done it for founders as such, but, you know, through the 30% club, that's what we are doing is we're standing up for all women at all levels and trying to help women get through the various levels and network with one another and do all of these things. So I hope we're making a contribution, but I imagine the other ladies have done a lot more. 
Uh, I, I certainly um, have had to on a few occasions um, um, and it can be very uncomfortable um, sometimes when you have to put your hand up when you know you're at events and there's no female speakers and no female judges and you know you're kind of the one that's the social warrior you know speaking out ladies going I'm not comfortable that there's no female pictures at this event I'm not comfortable that there's no female judges at this event um, and then especially when you were you know to get blocked by the organizer of the event the next day when it could have easily been handled um, you know with like well we really overlooked that and we'll do better next time Niamh, and thank you so um, but you know standing up for what you believe in is uncomfortable right so that's why we need to do it more and that's why we need to pave the way for more females and I'm sure it hasn't happened at you know those future events in in um in that organization but they'd be more conscious of it because i stood up but it was really uncomfortable and i remember telling my you know my kids the next morning i was like i've got a pain in my stomach because i said something last night and i'm not sure if i should have said it and there was a lot of people there and but um i, I could see it in their little faces that yeah mom you did the right thing you know um and it'll make it easier for you know more females that want to pitch and that deserve to have female judges at those events as well and that's so, yeah, it is hard but we should do more of it <laughs> There's, there's explicit bias and then there's unconscious bias and and, and the unconscious bias is, is very much persistent um, and, and organizations and, and um, you know, need to do more to, to address that. And obviously IWD now is about breaking the bias. But um, in terms of, of other questions, we have um, female founders face many issues at seed funding level in Ireland. What is the panel's thoughts on this? Um, Amy, I might just go to you. I know that you're self-funded and I think that that's really interesting for people to hear as well, because obviously we're talking about the challenges with VC funding and um, the lack of female representation in terms of the general partners of VC funds. Um, but it is possible to scale a, a very successful business self-funded. So I'd love to hear what your, how you did it. Yeah. Quite quickly. <laughs> I, I come from a very small family. So I've got a single mom who's amazing, but she was badly hit by the recession, which is why I jumped into the workforce at such a young age. And, you know, no regrets. I absolutely loved it. But I think from that, I've been very burned from anything debt related. So I'm not saying it's a negative to have funding. Like I see businesses scale. And I think it's absolutely amazing. And, you know, I'm constantly going back and forth. Will I, won't I? And we've, we've had some offers obviously in the last few months, but to date we're hundred percent self-funded, you know, no debt, no loans, no nothing which I'm really proud of because like you said, it, it is unusual and, you know, albeit we probably could have had a quicker growth journey, but for me, it was about trying to walk before we can run and understanding, you know, the level of growth that we wanted to get to and having all the processes in place before we go right out to the international market. So we'll see what holds for the future, but up until now and, and for the foreseeable, yeah, we're fully self-funded. It's, it's absolutely incredible. I know Neve as well and, and Rachel, we talked about um, the challenges of, of VC funding, but hopefully in terms of, of the various different supports, um, you know, and, and speaking about those, um, uh, Neve, you've, you've taken some funding. Uh, actually, what's yeah. an incredible story for you is that um, your client became your biggest funder, um, which is such a, a vote of confidence in Altada. Um, rock, rock, yeah. rock, rock, rock. Well, Rock, yeah, Rock Top um, Partners, like it's a huge um, validation to what you're doing in your industry when your client says, look, can we invest, you know, can we come in alongside this journey with you? They've been incredible with our use cases and stuff. Um, but as you know, just prior to that, Claire, we came out of examinership. So we had to go to the high court to save our company um, to meet the test for examinership. Um, and that was an incredible journey for like all the original um, techies to stand in the back of the court and, and persuade the high court judge that there was real IP in the company and a real prospect of survival. So, you know, there is um, a test that if you meet it, that you can come out of examinership. Um, but I think that the reason we were in that situation is because the angel, um, the seed and the angel uh, industry um, at the moment is just unregulated in Ireland. You know, people are getting offers of convertible loan notes that are just, you know, if they were published in the paper, you they literally the hair would stand on the back of your, of your neck there's some of the offers that companies have got you know from even in our um you know our forum with enterprise ireland we listened to founders saying that their you know their investor told them that they can't take a salary and increase their salary for you know the next three years and you know telling businesses how they should run their business after giving them an investment of fifty thousand euros you know so there's some horror stories in the seed stage for angel investment you know i'm just saying are the angels dressed as devils you know because some of the stories in my own personal experience um have been some of these offers would leave you literally going really sure there's no risk like i have to give you back you get double your money back if this doesn't work out and we have to do this if this is the case and and the percentages um and you know so i think a lot of the issues are like female and male-led companies 
businesses getting out of the stage, the seed stage of their company um, with a good valuation and then over to America, over to the States where they think you're too cheap, Claire, if your valuation is too low and you've already lost 30 or 40 percent of your company before you get out the gate. So I think there is going to have to be a need for regulation. Um, around what, what pe angels can take from a company and what they can impose in a company early on in their journey. Um, so I think, Amy, well done. I mean, fantastic to be able to, to do that and to take those steps to protect yourself and secure your foundations. I think it's an incredible story. Congratulations, absolutely amazing. It's, it's phenomenal. And I think that, you know, more female founders talking about those challenges of funding is also really important. And I know that um, that's something that uh, all brighter are looking to do um, in terms of the, the various events. Um, so it's, it's you know, more stories. I think that's the thing. We just need to hear, hear from more women. <laughs> um, I have another question that um, somebody asked to, to get to the end. Um, could you please tell me about a challenging season or moment that had the potential to discourage you or overwhelm you and what put what you put in place to overcome it? Many thanks, Marcia. Thanks, Marcia. Um, so a challenging season or moment that had the potential to, to discourage you or well or, or overwhelm you, but that you put in what and what you put in place to overcome it. Um, who would like to take that one? I could give you a personal one just while everybody's getting going. I remember coming home one night and my young daughter was in hospital because she'd fallen down the stairs and I had gone to a committee meeting to become kind of a president in one of the accounting organisations. And But when she asked me why I wasn't there when she or why I wasn't at the hospital with her, I couldn't satisfactorily explain to myself why what I was doing was more valuable than being at the hospital with her. So the following day, I went to the organization. I said, sorry, I know you are depending on me to move along the diversity in this organization, but I just can't do that. So I do think you have to make decisions for yourself at the particular point in time. And it is important that you are able to combine your family, your interests and your work um, and have everything moving generally in the right direction. And that does require some small and big calls all the time. I think that's that's great advice. You know, it's it's very unique. It's a very personal um, journey we're all on, and and it's making those decisions for yourself and for your family and for your your um, uh, for your your goals and aspirations. Um, thank you, Marie. I, guys, I'm. I, it's now six minutes past. So I'm very conscious that people are going to be uh, needing to get on with their day and open the bottle of prosecco if it's not too early. Um, it's the afternoon now. But um, listen, thank you so much, all of you, for for joining, and to all of our attendees for your questions and your engagement. Um, really feel very privileged to have had the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, and you know, it is. It's it's a very a desperate time in the world at the moment. Um, and we're very cognizant of how fortunate we are um, to be here and to be um, talking about our businesses and the opportunities that lay ahead. Um, obviously, we are all going to do everything we can to, to support um, people who are, are coming, hopefully, to Ireland um, from the Ukraine. Um, and, you know, that there will be a lot of support needed for, for the women and, 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 and children that are, um, you know, displaced. Listen, thank you so much. Um, it has been a very uplifting conversation. I've enjoyed it. I've, I've learned a lot from all of your, your, your wisdom. Um, and I'm looking forward to hopefully meeting you all in person over the little next couple of months um, now that COVID has, has finally, we, we, it's in our rear view mirror. Um, thank you all so much. We'll see thank you, Claire. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Liz. Thank, thank you, Claire. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.